Q&A in the Q&A section at the bottom and the questions will be queued in the order received. And please, uh, if you uh, don't wait until uh, there's 30 seconds left to uh, ask the question. Uh, so I'd like to welcome um, Tamash Botsam. He is a senior threat analyst at VMRay. He's responsible for finding and analyzing relevant uh, malware samples and very interested in evasive in the wild samples and exploitation. He regularly writes on the VMRA technical blog. And he is going to talk about the open source malware um, URSNIF or URSNIF. Um, it's a relatively complex and full featured malware um, that was, uh, which code was, uh, was uh, leaked and uh, different criminal groups have created a swarm of variants for criminal leak code and uh, hence uh, the nightmare. Take it away. Thank you. So I'm Tomasz Bosan and my topic is leak, is my very big leak source code and specifically your name. So when discussing malware tracking, we mostly mean the development and the distribution of malware as a service or samples created by malware as a service. And normally these uh, malware as a service type types of malware operate closed source. So the main components, the builder and the panels are closed source. And of course, they also have some open source components uh, such as a stage that is used during, the, during a manual attack might be used to deliver the malware or it's possible that a component of the malware itself is open source, such as a component for privilege escalation. What we normally do is that we track the closed source components and we do not track at all the open source tools which are used in attacks because uh, they, are so, uh, they are so common that they would give us no data, but it's, it might be worthwhile uh, sometimes to track the components which are used inside the malware, even though they are open source. So checking closed source malware gives us usually a very clear classification. So if we, we can often, we can usually classify the unpacked payload into one of the common malware families, and we can identify its variant and version. And this gives us a clear list of malware capabilities which allows, allows to measure detection. So if we know what types of malware are in the wild, we can clearly measure our own defenses. We can measure the effectiveness of security products and we can improve our defense. This also gives us for a single family, usually a linear version history. So we know what variant of what version of the malware added which feature. And we can also track the modules which are used by the malware. So we know when a new module has appeared and how it, the new module is being developed. But then uh, what sometimes happens is that criminals have a breach and their source code leaks. First, it visually leaks to some forum and then it sometimes leaks to the open web. And then a nice clear understanding of the thread goes out the window basically. So this gives us many problems even besides tracking. So the, here, the service that leaked, the source code that leaked is not just a tool or a component that can be used within an existing malware service, but it's an entirely new service. Uh, so the malware author can just start a new criminal enterprise based on the leaked service. Also attackers were paying for this service before, so it's obviously valuable. It's not uh, something that is available from, for free from open source. Also, it's, the biggest problem probably is that a bunch of forks are created based on this open source code. For criminals, this means that creating a new malware service is basically free. Uh, as for the code, they just need the infrastructure so the cost of entry to create a new malware service is dangerously reduced. And for defenders, it means that detection is somewhat more difficult because the 
um, the malware became more diverse. And the biggest impact is that tracking it gets extremely challenging now. The reason it's challenging is that the leaked code that is that the forks have in almost entirely the same source code. Sometimes the client side might even be completely identical and it's possible that the forks only change the server side of the mobile or the panel that is visible to the attacker. It also happens that the information that is available from open sources is inconsistent, which is very understandable. So tracking these uh, different variants of leaked, uh, leaked malware is very challenging. So it happens that uh, blogs and uh, papers and especially Twitter calls these samples by different names and groups them very differently. Uh, all in all that tracking these leaked source malware needs a very different methodology from tracking closed source malware. So to establish our methodology, or at least to present it, uh, we will be uh, presenting a case study that we conducted over Eursniff. This is also known as ISFB or COSI, or many of its variants are known by different names from different sources. Uh, probably the most technically correct name was would be ISFB, because that's how the developers called the original leak code but the uh, most accepted uh, industry standard name for it is your sniff. So I'll be calling it your sniff. Really the naming doesn't matter as much as the grouping. So how, how we label each group is probably not that important as what each group contains. So why we pick this malware is that it's been on GitHub since at least 2015, uh, which means that if we observe how the malware looks now, we can observe the long-term effect of the leak. So we can see how it changed in five years. The most important takeaway is that, uh, is that when tracking the malware, we're looking for divergences from the leaked source code. And these divergences are implemented by the attacker to please their customers. So they implement customer facing changes the customer being the attacker who they sell their malware service to. So they are either some new feature or some way to, uh, to bypass uh, security software and researchers. The first uh, logical idea would be to track the changes in the payload. Uh, so the original payload of the malware was mostly focused on attacking browsers. Uh, so it conducted many browser attacks where it uh, hooked certain uh, API calls of browsers and then modified HTML or injected HTML and JavaScript into uh, web pages of banks or other, other websites which contain credentials. And it also did uh, cookie grabbing. But besides this, it was also a very versatile uh, and quite generic bot, uh, it implemented a bunch of other features, such as it provided a SOX proxy to the victim service, which is also, which was at the time also very useful for uh, making, making it more difficult for the bank to detect that, uh, that even though it's uh, the client is using the correct credentials and the correct two-factor authentication keys, it's still not the same client. So at least the IP address was the same. Today, this is probably not enough. It also implemented key logging and screen recording features, and it could also grab other data such as emails or passwords from FTP or instant messages, and it get, could grab files based on their file path. Um, since then, uh, uh, there was mostly necessary maintenance for the new, new browser versions. So to still successfully add hooks to new browsers, they needed to conduct maintenance to the uh, browser still in module. There's also a bunch of new web inject kits. So the, uh, the JavaScript, which is injected into the browser, uh, these web inject kits were always separate from the malware itself. These are separate projects. They just have 
developed separately from the malware since then, and they are now their own separate industry. Uh, there is also VNC compatibility. So when the uh, attacker is trying to steal, uh, trying to access somebody's banking information, then they often need to uh, access it from their computer, their browser. So they VNC in and they conduct their attack from the victim browser, try to trick, try to trick them into giving them their two-factor authentication or just doing something once they are already logged in. Um, and they also added uh, stealing from additional applications. So what's good about tracking by payload is that they are diverse, especially in their configuration. Uh, but what makes it not so good is that all of this data is stored on the server side and it's not easy to get this data. And it's especially not quick to get this data. Uh, the servers try to filter connections which they consider legitimate. And so they try to filter out researchers and automations. And there's also a manual element to it. So sometimes to observe the full attack, the attacker needs manual inter interaction. So we would actually need to fool a human to get the data that we need. The biggest problem with it is still that it's very slow and we need, need an active server for it. So we can't do this retroactively for thousands of samples quickly. Uh, so a uh, probably better idea is to do it based on the changes inside in the panel that are shown to the attacker for uh, controlling and configuring their bots. The reason it's good is that it's very user facing. So this is the most likely thing for the devel malware developers to develop, to change uh, compared to the leaks. And what's even better is that a panel change translates to a communication protocol change. So we can observe it on the client side without interacting with the panel at all, or even the panel being online. We can just uh, observe this communication protocol on the client side. So at first, uh, the network beacon looks completely useless. It's just a bunch of encrypted and encoded data. And it's also using a user agent, which is runtime generated. But luckily, if we dive deeper, we find that before the encryption, these uh, network beacons were generated from format, format strings inside the malware. And these format strings have minor differences compared to the leaked code. Uh, so let's get those format strings. Uh, we can either decrypt them from the BSS section where the malware stores them, but it's easier to just observe them at runtime. So these uh, small format strings are all new compared to the original uh, source code. And there's many, many more depending on the malware variant. So what we do is that we extract uh, all of these format strings for the uh, thousands of samples. We uh, clean it up, then cluster it, and then we can generate Jira rules from it. And these Jira rules look somewhat different from the Jira rules that we're used to. Uh, so most Jira rules are used for detection. So they only contain positive parameters that should match or very few negative parameters that are used to uh, mitigate FPs. But here they are mostly negative checks. So uh, format strings that should not be in this variant. And there are also a few uh, format strings that should be in this variant. And this gives us some initial clustering. For some variants, this is all that is needed. For them, it's excellent, such as because we see some parameters that are only used by one variant. But it also happens that, and that something such as the uptime gets adapted by an other variant or, or more, uh, probably a better example would be Tor. Tor was uh, used by uh, one variant called DreamBot, but it was later adopted by other variants too. So just using the format strings is not, uh, not always enough to detect the differences between the variants. Uh, 
So if we go deeper, we arrive at configuration instruction, which is what we need. It's the most work, but it gives the most best results. So there's a bunch of good data that we can get from configuration extraction. We can get the encryption keys. So uh, it uses two types of uh, encryptions, uh, RSA and Serpent. Uh, RSA is used for signing, uh, signing requests and signing files inside embedded inside the malware. And Serpent is used uh, for symmetric encryption. Uh, this is the only time I've ever seen Serpent. Uh, Serpent is an encryption protocol that is not really used anymore. It was considered to be the encryption uh, algorithm for AES, but it got second place. So basically it's never used except for yourself. Uh, very valuable is in the clustering is the type of configuration. So as we will see, there's a bunch of types of configurations that we need to handle when extracting the model, extracting from the model. There are also domains for command and control, which are sometimes useful, sometimes not so useful. And also sometimes useful are uh, identifiers in the configuration. The configuration contains key value pairs where the key is a random ID or sometimes uh, an ID generated from a string with CRC. And the value is a string. So uh, it could be something like a, a domain to, con to connect or configurations for the key locking module. Uh, so your sniff stores its configuration in custom data structures, which it named joint files. So there are two of these embedded files that we actually care about. One of them, one of them is the embedded public key. And the other one is the uh, base configuration for the malware that contains every other data that we care about, uh, including the serpent key. So each of these files is uh, represented with a metadata structure that we see on screen. Um, and over the years, these have sometimes changed uh, and different variants now have uh, different metadata structures and even completely different ways of storing the configuration. And mostly just uh, reorganization and adding additional encryption on top of the original. Uh, so if we start digging more into it, we will find that we have to follow a bunch of, in the, in the bunch of uh, pointers to get to other structures, then get to even more structures, and then finally get to the strings that we want. And we need to do the same for RSA keys, for public keys, when there is just a single uh, XOR for obfuscation. So this uh, base configuration is actually very simple to extract and uh, understand. But uh, later it got much more complicated. Uh, so first there was some uh, new type of obfuscation added, but that's not really the problem. The possible problem is that there is now a proper encryption inside with a runtime generated key. So extracting this uh, runtime generated key could be tricky. Uh, but to get it, uh, but if we have the runtime generated key, we also uh, got the RSA key just like before. And for extracting the configuration for this variant, we didn't need anything else, just this runtime generated key. This gets uh, different uh, for the last type of configuration that is commonly used. Here, the structure has been moved around much more. But the biggest change is that we is still one of the biggest changes is that we need a different runtime generated serpent key. So it's generated in a more complex way that is harder to extract. But the biggest difference is that we actually need this RSA key to extract the rest of the data because the RSA key encrypts another, yet another uh, internal key, which is used to decrypt the configuration. The point here is uh, just that since the original 
original structure, it got way more complex, but in the same way. So there's no major uh, changes in a way that they reorganized everything. They just moved things around and added even more uh, questionable encryption on top of the already questionable encryptions. So all of these uh, configuration types have further subvariants where uh, some, some parameters are moved around even more or some key lengths are different, but uh, otherwise they are the same. So after a lot of reversing, uh, I can now automatically extract and parse the configuration for the thousands of samples that I have. And we finally have all the data that we need to provide a correct classification. Um, now the problem that I'm facing is that I have too much data uh, to, to establish correct classification. So I need to pick the ones that I want to use. And I need to uh, cluster these samples in a way that they actually represent real world clusters, real world variants, and not just arbitrarily defined clusters. Uh, so to validate if my clustering is correct, I like to use graphs. So here we see uh, 4,000 samples. Uh, each one is a node on the graph and each sample is connected to its configuration type and all of these cryptographic keys that I extracted from them. So the first thing that we notice on this graph is, well, it's probably that it looks very nice. But the second thing that we notice is that uh, there are two completely different uh, distinct clusters that are not connected to each other in any way. So that means that the two clusters do not share any cryptographic keys at all, uh, not even the internal ones. Uh, this is interesting because on the surface, these samples are extremely similar, but based on the extracted data, they, uh, it's trivial to draw the lines. They look like completely different malware families. Uh, the, left, uh, the left cluster is what's centered around one of the major configuration types, the most uh, complex one. This uh, currently has the most samples in the past six months. Uh, and it's often referred to as to by the industry as either version three of ISFP or RM3 of ISFP. So it's perhaps different, it's perhaps difficult to see the samples themselves uh, on this graph. So let's remove everything but the samples. And here, uh, and here we can see only the samples. And uh, if two samples are close to each other on this graph, that means that they share at least some of the cryptographic keys. And uh, we can also zoom into the graph to, uh, to see why they are so close to each other. So what makes them similar and here I found that the most reliable way to find variants within this version three is by the key that is used internally within the malware. So that, is, that allows me to find different software versions and the other keys which, are, which can actually be configured by the user can be used sometimes to find different attackers or different uh, users of this malware service. Uh, this works also somewhat uh, for this right cluster, uh, but it's still too messy. It needs more parameters to define the clusters more clearly. So here, that's what I did. I added even more parameters. Uh, I added uh, the top level domains of the connected servers. And I also added the configuration IDs. So the configuration IDs roughly give, give me the uh, possible features of the malware that the attacker can configure for themselves. And because these configuration IDs also change, it also separates the variants somewhat. So at first glance, this uh, graph looks even messier, but if we remove everything but the samples, then we see that now we have two nice and separate uh, clusters. And the top one is often referred to by the industry as IAP for the panel that it uses. <clears throat> 
and the lower one is sometimes referred to as Gosiet um, because it's they are all centered around the either the dot at domain so they are connecting to the dot at domains or they are using uh, encryption keys which which were uh, used by samples which connected to the this domain we have five minutes okay thank you so if we uh, go further back in time and we add samples from uh, the past which happened before six months then we see that there used to be another cluster which now completely disappeared it was uh, around the dot onion tld so it used tor this cluster of samples was called dreambot and it uh, disappeared a couple of months ago so now we can observe the some of the long-term effects of malware source, source code leak uh, through this uh, through this case study. So what you observe is that there are still multiple active services that are using variants of the leak source code, but these variants are slowly getting replaced by uh, more modern malware, such as at the as the case was with Dreambot. But even after five years. Uh, multiple variants of the malware are still going strong as separate services. So when looking for changes since the uh, original version, we see that the defining properties have amplified. So the core feature has remained. It's still, uh, it's still mostly used for stealing banking data, but we also observe a generalization. So now it's uh, used in a more generic way uh, to deliver secondary uh, pieces of malware. And uh, we also observe that internally, uh, what internally is just more of the same. So in the leak source code, the configuration was stored in a complex and hard to parse way. And since then it got even more complex and even more difficult to parse, but still not impossible. So if you want to detect it, we should detect it wide. So we should target uh, by the, with the detection, the core behavior with your sniff, these are browser attacks and file stealing. And if you want to track this malware, then we should do the opposite. We should not focus on the core behavior, but instead focus on everything else. So focus on the changes which are introduced uh, by the malware developers for their users and how this translate into minor code changes or even better, uh, minor configuration changes. So there has already been a lot of uh, good quality research about this topic. This is a well-researched piece of malware. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of work that I can recommend. Uh, these slides will be online and I recommend you check out uh, these pieces of research if you're interested in it more. So thank you for listening and I hope you have some time for some questions. Yes, we have a little time. Um, we have a question. What about those samples that are not sharing any similarities with the others? Uh, and they are separated in the graph. Are they crafted by someone who has completely rewritten the original? That's a good question. So even on this uh, final graph, there are some separate samples that didn't fit any of these big classifications that I meant. So um, these uh, cannot, re cannot uh, reuse any of the uh, public keys because they would need the private key for it. Uh, so uh, on this graph, they appear as outliers uh, on, the, on the lower sections on this uh, graph or in the outskirts of the uh, lower one. Uh, these are the ones which are using uh, one of the old config structures, but are not uh, sharing uh, enough uh, cryptographic keys with the others to make them similar. Uh, these are very rare though. So if somebody starts a new project, it's likely that they turn to some newer leaked code, not something that's five years old. All right. Um, I think we're exactly on time. And um, so I'd like to thank you very much for an interesting talk.
And uh, I think there's a short break before a keynote, if that's correct, Josh. That is correct. There'll be about a 20 minute break and then you can log back in for the final keynote today. Right.